this house right here is where Joe Pesci's real life character from the movie Casino, Tony Spilotro, had an informant murdered. Okay everybody, this is Mooney Dashcam. Today we are in Paradise, Las Vegas. We're going to be talking about Tony Spilotro, the Chicago mob boss that was actually played by Joe Pesci in the movie Casino, which I'm sure you may have all seen. If you haven't, go check it out. It's a good movie. We're talking about him ordering a hit on someone that was informing with the police, and the person who carried out that hit, Frank Collada, explained it in really great detail. So this should be an interesting one. We're going to go to the house where they actually killed the guy, so let's flip this around and get into it. So the address that we're going to in this video is 2365 East Rawhide Street in Paradise, Las Vegas. It happened in October of 1979. The main people of this story are Frank Collada, who was a part of the Hole in the Wall gang, the very notorious Hole in the Wall gang, and he was an associate of the Chicago mob. And then we have Sherwin Jerry Listener, who is kind of a... He was a con man around Vegas. We'll get into him, of course. He's the one getting murdered in the story. So Frank Culotta is very close to Tony Spilotro. They grew up together, they were best friends, and Tony is really a very high-ranking member in the Chicago mob outfit. They always say outfit. Why do they say outfit? Well, someone let me know. So this guy, Jerry Listener, wanted to get close with Frank as a friend. They hang out a few times. Jerry then brings up a scheme that he had in mind because he knew who Frank was from around, I'm sure. These guys were very well known in Vegas, Frank and Tony. So his scheme was to rob a Florida mobster of $175,000 cash. The way they would do this is they would tell him that they have $500,000 of marked money, of stolen money that they were going to give him in exchange for the $175,000 of clean money and then the Florida mobster can go on his way and clean that marked money however he saw fit. So the guy Jerry brings up to Frank because he needed him and Tony Spilotro's support on this. The reason why is because when the Florida mobster finds out he got screwed he would try and come after Jerry but he probably wouldn't if he knew that Jerry was hooked up with Frank and Tony because they, the guy would be scared of Frank and Tony they had a very very serious reputation Frank was doubtful he didn't really think anyone would go for that kind of BS but he brings it up to Tony anyway and to his surprise Tony says go for it why not now, the plan was to have the person come to Washington, D.C. This isn't the first time that Jerry did this, by the way. It maybe is the first time Jerry did it to a mobster. I think he would normally do it to businessmen. But they'd come to Washington, D.C., where Jerry's police officer brother-in-law, nicknamed Junior, last name Blevins, the guy Junior had a team of other police officers that he recruited so there were a lot of guys that ended up getting wrapped up in this whole situation. So there were a couple of police officers, not just him. They really made a, a system out of this. So whoever was there to come with the clean money, obviously Jerry would let his brother-in-law know. The police would stop them, all corrupt officers, and they would confiscate the money in exchange for not bringing up any charges on them. Because they didn't have any good reason why they would have that much cash, that much money on them. And of course, the police officers knew why they were there. And once you get your money stolen from you, from the police, who are you gonna go report it to? You were there to wash money. You are there to go collect more money than you were giving. They had to collect stolen money. So it was kind of, it was a good plan. It was a good scheme the guy had going. And he pulled it off successfully many, many times. Now this time it didn't work out. Frank did not get into specifics on why it didn't work out. Now, I will give a disclaimer. Most of this information that I got for this video is from the Vlad TV interview. Frank explains this in great detail. I recommend going to watch that video. I did add some other information in there that I found from around, 
but mostly it is from Frank's exact words talking about it. I felt this was a red light, not a stop sign, but it was a stop light. We don't like stop lights. So at this point, Frank hated Jerry. He said from the whole time he really didn't like him. Frank said Jerry wasted his time and he wanted $5,000 cash in return. Jerry said he didn't have $5,000, but he'll get it to him. But he did have 10,000 quaaludes. He called them lemons. So Frank took those and he ended up selling them to one of his guys for more than $5,000. So Frank made out, at least with a little bit of money, for his wasted trip to Washington, D.C. Jerry ends up getting arrested in Washington, D.C. for the whole scheme that he had going on with the police officers. All the police officers got arrested also. Now he testifies in front of a grand jury and tells them that Frank and Tony were involved. Now that was mostly lies according to Frank. I mean, I guess they were kind of involved. They attempt to do it, but it didn't work out. At the time in Vegas, no one knows he testifies, including Frank and Tony. Listen to the bad luck that Jerry has. Jerry and his lawyer are back in Vegas in a restaurant for dinner. Not known to them, it's actually Sam Giancana's restaurant, who was one time the boss of the Chicago mob outfit. So after Jerry leaves, the lawyer hangs around, and one of Sam Giancana's men is in there, and they get to talking to the lawyer. Just kind of fishing on what's going on. The lawyer starts bragging that he's representing Jerry, who's testifying against gangsters from Vegas. And he goes, oh, I wonder if you know them. Sam's guy goes, I don't know any gangsters. So he goes, ah, it's Tony Spilotro and Frank Collada. And he goes, ah, never heard of them. Of course, right when that lawyer leaves, he calls up Tony Spilotro to tell him exactly what that lawyer said. And now they got the scoop. They know that Jerry's testifying and involving them in these situations. Now, once Tony heard this, Tony turns to Frank and says, that he has to whack Jerry. Before Frank gets to do anything, the FBI knocks on his door and he gets a subpoena to go to the grand jury in DC. The whole time he's there, he said in quotes, he lied like a dog. I'm gonna put in some um, clips from the video because the way he talks is great. Very old school Chicago. And I sat in the room and I lied like a dog. Then they put me in front of a grand jury, and I proceeded to lie. So he lied to the FBI and the grand jury, and then he leaves there. Before they're really able to put a case together, they needed to kill Jerry. The guy that Frank decides to bring is another member of the Hole in the Wall crew, Wayne Matecki. He picks up Wayne from Chicago, gets back to Vegas, calls up Jerry right away, and tells him he has a mark, and asks if he's ready. Jerry says he's ready, so Frank and Wayne go right to Jerry's house. Frank gets inside and immediately shoots Jerry in the back of the head. Wayne stayed in the car. He was kind of there for backup in case anything went wrong and things get a little crazy in there. Jerry runs after getting shot. Frank said he emptied the gun out in his head before he went two feet. Now, he said he had half load bullets, which from what I looked up means he had blanks in a 25 caliber revolver. So this was a weak gun to begin with and then he had blanks in there. I know blanks could definitely kill somebody if you have them pressed up against the skull, but it doesn't seem like that's exactly what he did here. In the house, I shot him immediately in the back of the head. He proceeded to run. I know I emptied the gun out in his head before he Went two feet. Now the gun had half loads. It was a 25 or a 22. I believe it was a 25. If anyone has any more information on half loads, let me know. So Frank chases Jerry into the kitchen. As Jerry falls to the ground, he hits the garage door button on the wall. So Frank hits it again to stop it from opening. Jerry falls between Frank's legs. And now Frank is out of bullets. So he grabs a cord to a water cooler and starts choking him, the cord breaks. Now he's looking around like, what should I do? He reaches to grab a knife to cut his throat 
and then his buddy Wayne opens the door, closes the garage door, and Frank asks Wayne, what are you doing in here? He goes, I counted the shots, you were out of shots, and I waited 10 minutes, I figured you were in trouble, which he was. And he gives him more bullets. So Frank reloads the gun, right here is the house, we'll stop a few houses away. So like I said, Frank reloads the gun and says to Wayne to get two pillows off the couch. This is the house right here that this all happened. They're in the kitchen while this is going on. So Wayne goes and grabs those two pillows. Frank presses the pillows up against Jerry's head and empties the rest of the bullets in the revolver. Then as Jerry's falling, he says, my wife knows you're here. Not that they cared. Frank thinks he shot him about 11 or 12 times. He tells Wayne that they're throwing the body in the pool to get rid of the DNA. They drag him out to the backyard to the pool they push them in, and then they jump in also to get all the blood off themselves. They said the body sank right to the bottom and the blood rose back up. Frank was like, okay, I'm done, I'm going back. Wayne said, wait, let me search through the house to see if there's any audio equipment or cameras that caught us. So Frank waits in the car and Wayne goes through the whole house. I mean, this is crazy. This is really where this murder went down. So Frank's in the car going, what's taking so long? It took like 15 or 20 minutes in there. Eventually, Wayne comes jumping out over the wall, the one by the pool. I think it maybe is this side that concrete wall, or maybe there was a wall here back then. This is 1979. And then they leave and they dump everything on the runway to McCarran Airport. Apparently used to come up to the road Eastern. And then Frank said, the desert covers everything. So I don't know if they buried them or just tossed them and waited for the desert to eat it up. I'm not sure. Say hello to whatever that is. Finish off the rest of the story right now. So the reason Frank was able to tell the story like he did is because he ended up cooperating later on. The FBI came to him and showed him a recording caught of Tony saying basically that he needed to kill Frank. In his words, he said, we need to clean out our dirty laundry. And they showed Frank that tape, and that's his childhood best friend. They were best friends. So he cooperated at that time. Frank said Wayne ended up beating the case. Frank ends up dying August 20th, 2020 from COVID complications at 81 years old. Now, if any of you guys seen Casino, you kind of already know what happened here. But June 22nd, 1986, eight days after they were killed, Tony Spilotro and his brother were found buried one on top of the other in their underwear in a cornfield in Indiana. So that was a true part of the story. They really were killed and buried together in a cornfield in their underwear. An interesting part of this is that Frank was a technical consultant on the movie Casino when Martin Scorsese was filming it. So there's a murder scene where they go and kill somebody that uh, hid out in Costa Rica, which actually happened. They did actually go and kill an informant that hid out in Costa Rica. But he, Frank is watching the scene and he yells out and he goes, oh, that's not how it was done. So Scorsese looks at him and goes, Get him into wardrobe, and he ends up in the movie. I'll show you that clip right now of him in the movie, blowing the guy's head off. The first one to skip was John Nance. 
he found a nice, warm, secluded place in Costa Rica. He thought nobody would find him there. Thank God. But anyway, they, you know, they all had a... F so, I hope you guys enjoyed. That's pretty much everything I have to tell you about this event. Hope to see you guys in the next one.